views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey everybody, I'm the Dr. Bob Lee. Welcome to Open BXRX, our special coverage of COVID-19, also known as the coronavirus, and how it's impacting our community and beyond. We'll also be talking about the protesting in honor of George Floyd. So we have that and a whole lot more. Coming up on today's show, we'll learn about the mental health amid this pandemic and programs available to help. And we'll talk to the founder of Depressed Gay Black Men and learn about the COVID-19 and how it relates to HIV. Then we'll find out what one woman is doing using her voice to educate others on politics and civic engagement. After that, we'll be joined by a small business owner and hear how, uh, well, what they're doing with current events and how it's impacting him and the changes to his store. Then Bobby C has the latest in the world of sports. And then later on, we'll learn about programs with businesses who are struggling during this pandemic. So stay tuned. All this and more is headed your way because we are now open. Welcome back once again up to Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS and Bronx Nets Channel 67 and 68. All right, our next guest is the Executive Director of Black Mental Health Alliance and joins us to share more about their work and uh, what you should know. We welcome Andrea Brown. Welcome to the show. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. Yes. Tell us all about it. So, you know, we find ourselves in a unique moment in history as we, you know, navigate COVID, the collateral uh, impact on communities of color, and uh, these recent uprising. And so the Black Mental Health has been in existence for almost 40 years, and uh, we've been able to do that, do what we do, um, really because of... Uh, We've been sensitive to what trauma looks like, what structural racism uh, does to communities. And uh, we pride ourselves on content and trainings that are culturally relevant to uh, meeting the needs of Black and African American communities. And what is that mission and, statement? And uh, well, that, that, that's an absolute long mission statement, all of which yeah. I'm happy to give you. And, um, but our, our mission statement really is to promote, to promote uh, and sponsor trusted, culturally relevant educational forms, trainings, and referral services that support the health and well-being of Black people in vulnerable communities. That says um, a which lot. Is right what we, we, yeah. It really does. And we see that not just in Baltimore, but in pockets of communities across the country. And so, you know, our inability to deal with uh, our inability to train and, and help communities deal with uh, structural racism, just put, the cycle perpetuates itself. And so we really want to help communities heal and become whole. Do you find that uh, with COVID-19 out there, more people are reaching out to you? We do. We find that um, because it looks different. It looks different for communities of color. So, yes, we found a spike in our membership. We've seen a spike in calls for referrals. And, you know, we've hosted town halls and we have a series on the collateral impact of COVID-19 on communities of color and yeah. what that means financially. Um, you know, and we, we're helping people redefine when we talk about the front line. We hail, honestly, our doctors and nurses and those people oh, yeah. who are doing that work. But when we talk about these frontline workers who are black, who go in um, and who are often unprotected and still impacted, I mean, those are frontline. Our postal workers are frontline. That's the black middle class. Um, 
And so, you know, we, again, we find ourselves in an enter and we, again, we are redefining for the black community, uh, what front line looks like, what does health and wellness look yeah. like and what, you know, and, and, you know, in this, in this space that we're in, how do we educate our, our, our children when many communities are un, already under resourced? And so for our, some of our Caucasian counterparts who have, who have the luxury of having Zoom and some other things. When some some kids, you know, are trying to do homework and packets on Zoom on their smartphone. So it's a different. It, you know, you see inequities and in, and in, and in, in all of this. And so, you know, how do we bridge that gap? How do we provide resources? And more importantly, how do we help communities find their voice so that they can speak for themselves? Absolutely. And I'm right with you, uh, right up front with those frontline workers. You know, they're out there risking their yeah. lives and sometimes Absolutely. losing their lives to help us yeah. go on yeah. living our lives. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But with the with the protesting and the, uh, you know, the, the killings and the COVID-19 and everything, the, the unemployment, you name it. I mean, it's, you can go on yeah. down the line. But all yeah, of that, that's right. mental health is going to it's it's in the forefront but you know i think the stigma of it all will be probably forgotten yeah. that you, everybody's going to have to come out and reach out to somebody and say hey uh yeah, yeah. i need help yeah. I, I have a problem there's too many things that i'm dealing with right now in society and so that's where yeah. you guys yeah. come in right we do we that is where we come in but here's the thing you know for uh, the the, the black family has a long history of, um, of silence. And when I say silence, you know, one of the things that the Black Mental Health Alliance does is really how do we reduce the stigma of mental health? And so for, especially when we start talking about young people and for, you know, one, their Caucasian counterpart, they go, both go to Starbucks, one leaves and one says, I'm going someplace else. One says, well, I'm going to see my therapist. Well, there's no stigma. And so we are really working yeah. hard to reduce the stigma related to mental illness and mental health and to help young people and all people um, really become aware of mental health information so that they are able to identify, you know, identify what it looks like. And then, if, you know, if, if in, at, in the right therapy session, really use positive coping mechanisms to build mental health, you know what I mean? To build a healthy mental health outlook. So yeah, we, we are, but we are seeing that people are understanding that um, this is trauma, that that's what this is. This yeah. is trauma. And um, like these the war, uprising, back with PTSD. yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. That's exactly right. This is trauma. And, you know, when we understand that, then we really set ourselves up to be to better to better heal and receive help in this moment. Yeah, Hi, and, and so then, you know. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Go ahead. Finish. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, and for 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 people, period, but especially people of color, the the fear and the social isolation is a, a, a you know is another ball game because we have thrived mm -hmm. off of the extended family, and so. To be distant from them in this moment is difficult. Yeah. What are some of the things that you and your organization is doing, Andrea, to uh, help reduce the stigma of mental health? So a couple of things. We are, we've put together a pilot program called the Healing Youth Alliance. And what that is, is uh, that's, you know, what we've, we're doing it with the School of uh, Social Work and an, another community partner. And again, we focus on increasing mental health awareness decreasing the stigma. And so we've been meeting uh, with young people to talk to them about what that looks like, what that means, and to, to create a safe space for them. Um, and then we're doing trainings, obviously now via Zoom, for men, because that, that in and of itself is a whole nother, um, that's a different animal about how we, how we help men um, so they don't have to suffer in silence. And so again, we're doing, we're developing um, activities uh, via virtually so that men can weigh in. We're hosting panels. 
um, those kinds of things. And so, again, we are learning to navigate uh, the virtual space as much as we are able, um, as much as we are able during this time. And some people may not even know that they are suffering uh, from mental health. And um, it's going to take you and your organization and people like you to uh, to create that awareness. Um, yeah, so yeah. Some of the some of the symptoms may be what? So here's the thing. You, maybe you can't sleep. Maybe you, I, I you're, you're not sleeping. That. Yeah, the, you're not sleeping. Maybe your eating pattern is off and maybe you're angry. Um, and sometimes people are depressed and don't even understand that they're depressed because you have, you know, you've got this defense mechanism that you've put up and you keep, you, you think that you are managing throughout the day. And then here's, those kinds of things untreated lead to, lead to other health, uh, physical health issues. Um, and so we know some of the, uh, the root cause of that is trauma and mental health issues because that they've not been addressed. Oh, that's great. Good information. Lots of great information. Yeah. Yeah. Website, We're in a critical time. Yes, we do. Yeah, Absolutely. It's, uh, um, we can talk for a yeah, while no. on this because I know we could. Know, and people need that help. We could. Yes. Yeah, they, they need that help. And here's the thing. And we, we really want to. We can help children so that say we that, can break that, this cycle. Say that I say as, we, as we help adults so that we can, they can help children. So we break this cycle of silence so that you don't have to suffer alone. And then we, tr we, we show you what the triggers are. But let me just, I uh, love to help. Uh, love to encourage people to go to our website, which is yes. www.blackmentalhealth.com. Again, it's www.blackmentalhealth.com. Uh, we've got, uh, we, you know, we have a, um, a plethora of therapists who uh, have available to them culturally competent training and know how to do that. We, again, the Black Mental Health Alliance, are, you know, are ready and equipped to help train and educate and speak truth to what's ailing us. So would love to uh, would love to engage in further dialogue. So yes. I hope people reach out to us. That would just be great. Thank you so much, Andrea Brown, Executive Director, Black Mental Health Alliance. We appreciate you and thank you for all the work that you're doing. We appreciate you and thank you for bringing this to the forefront. We appreciate you. Thank you. All right, we'll take a break. Bye -bye. I've got more coming up next on Open. everybody of the Dr. Bob Lee and our next guest is uh, the founder and president and CEO of Depressed Black Gay Men and he's here with us today Antoine Craigwell welcome back. Thank you very much Bob Lee and how are you doing? Great uh, these are different situations different times you were not in the Bronx Net studios we we're in our personal studios and uh, how are you making out? Um, this, is, this is particularly challenging um, uh, Personally, um, when the pandemic hit, um, I'm accustomed to I'm work. I work from home, so I'm at home a lot. So yeah. there is not there is not really a problem with working from home. But when the pandemic hit, and we were put on all these lockdowns and social isolation, social distancing and isolating, and we couldn't go out except to the pharmacy or the supermarket or the post office or the bank. It became for me the equivalent of minimum security prison. I can go out, but I have to get back home. And it became like during winter, when I want to go downstairs just to take out the garbage, I have to put on several layers. 
Yeah. Now, when I'm going out, I have to put on mask, gloves, um, you know, make sure that I'm covered. And, yeah. and so it becomes difficult. And then trying to relate to people in their, when they're at home, and people think that working from home is a, is a peach, it's a holiday, it's a vacation, but it's actually much more difficult and you actually work longer hours. Yeah. And so now people, are, and now there are greater demands on people's time because they are trying to counteract the expectation that because they're at home, they're lagging and they're, they're not doing as, they're not being productive as they should. So people at home are trying to catch up and do as yeah. much more so they don't have time. Give us a little overview of your organization and tell us what you're doing uh, during this pandemic and through the protesting and everything. Well, one of the things that we have recognized is necessary is focusing on the mental health for our communities. Yeah. Because coronavirus, when it hit with the social distancing and isolation, created an an additional imposition on people of color mental health. Yeah. When we saw that in April and in May, we saw the spikes in the number of deaths, the equivalent of sometimes 28 to 30 deaths an hour in New York City, it began to make people feel afraid. It began to make people think, Am I next? And that, on top of being isolated, now if there are two different types of isolation here, there's the isolation of living by yourself. Yes. And so if something were to happen to me, what would happen? Who would know? Would people only know about me when I start to smell? Or there's the isolation that comes with living among family. And for many LGBT people of color, who are living among family, they are not out to their families. And so it's an additional burden on them to try to keep their sexual orientation or gender identity hidden while being among their family. And especially for those of color who are taking medication for HIV, they've got to find ways to hide that medication because they no longer have the opportunity or the ways in which they can find other ways to, to take their medication safely. And so there, yep. there, so there, and there may also be instances of domestic violence or intimate partner violence in the household. So there are a lot of additional stresses and anxiety that builds on top of people. How do you compare the two? There's the HIV AIDS epidemic when it first came out in the 80s. Uh, how do you compare it to COVID-19? They're both pandemics. And there are a lot of there are a lot of there are a lot of similarities more than differences. So let's talk about the similarities, the commonalities. Okay. First of all, it's a pandemic. Second of all, as a pandemic that has spread globally, it is immaterial where the pandemic began. The fact is that it is here. Second, it is affecting and devastating communities of color, particularly. That was one of the instances with HIV back in the 1980s. It was celebrated as the white gay disease, but unbeknownst or unacknowledged, thousands and thousands of black and Latino gay men were also being affected. Third, there has been a consistent denial by both the federal government and the state government and city government to address the pandemic COVID-19, COVID, as was the case back in the 1980s with HIV. And so by the time this federal, state, and local governments got their act together, thousands have died. And so what we are seeing also is that the city and the state, and God knows what the federal government is doing, is belatedly getting behind a contact and trace process when contact and trace were one of the key factors used to eliminate or reduce HIV spread in the 90s. One of the differences now 
that we see with COVID-19 versus HIV is that with COVID-19, it doesn't discriminate. It goes across the board between gay, straight, black, male, black, female. Yeah. Originally with HIV, it was predominantly among the, 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 the gay community and the transgender community. But then it started to spread in the late 90s to straight men and straight women and the elderly. So it started to, to disperse within the community. But originally, there was a high incidence in the Black and Latino gay, gay communities. Now, when you look out and you see people um, protesting, you see people of many different backgrounds. What do you have to say about that? Are they gonna? Are they more at risk of uh, of getting COVID nineteen from being out in close quarters together? Most certainly. Think, 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 think about it. We have seen reports from public health officials that are saying that a couple of things are kind of counterproductive and counterintuitive. Yeah. One is that because we have been lulled into the false sense of complacency thinking that the numbers of, of infections and deaths have, have dropped, that it means co in correlation, we can go ahead and release re and relax restrictions. But, yeah. but we also know that following George Floyd's murder last Monday, okay, and the massive protest that has erupted because another black man was killed by a white police officer, is perpetuating and continuing a particular kind of trope that many people decided to hell with the coronavirus. I need to get justice. We need to get justice, not just for George Floyd. We need to get justice for all the black people who have been killed by police and law enforcement, but also to express our fear that, the, that we may be next, just like coronavirus. Uh, hey, where can we go to get more information? Because you're, you're a wealth of information. I know a lot of people are calling you because of the position that you're in right now. You're, you're taking on, what do they call you briefly? They call you with mostly for, for what these days? Mostly for information about how to navigate, um, what to do, but mo sometimes often just to talk, just to yeah. connect. So like I started a Facebook group call I am here, I am here for you calling 10. And I've invited people to call 10 people once a day or once a week. That's a good idea, that's a good so idea. That, so that if I, if I send you a text, Bob, and I said, Bob, how are you doing? You're gonna respond fine. I don't know, Bob, if you are fine. But if I pick up the phone and I call you, you can and hear I say, Bob, how are you doing? Exactly. And I said, how are you doing, Bob? And Bob says, I'm fine. I said, no, let's start again, because that doesn't sound fine to me. Yeah. I said, let's start again. How are you really doing, Bob? And then we are able to enter into the conversation. Thank you so much. Antoine Craigwell, yeah. Founder, president, CEO, depressed black gay men. Thank you so much for all the work that you're doing in our community. We really, really appreciate you. Hope Thanks to have again. you back soon. All Thanks right. Thanks again, Bob. You got it. All right, we'll take a break. We've got more open. Stay right there. Hey, welcome back, everybody. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee, and I've got you covered like a blanket. 
civically re-engaged women, also known as crew. The crew is in the house, and the CEO, Sharon Nelson, has all the information. Tell us more about what you guys are working on. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Good morning. How are good you morning. today? Good morning, good, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> anyway, I thank you so much for having me on the show. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, pit stops, as they say. All right. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here because, you know, Dr. Bob, oftentimes, well, just getting to your question first, Crew is working on a mm. conference. We're doing a virtual celebration of the 19th Amendment, which is the 100th anniversary of American women getting the right to vote. That's going to be happening this July. Um, uh, uh, the exact date is the 23rd to the 25th, but because yeah. it's an odd conference it'll be available then and also in the future were you involved in the uh, blackout tuesday the movement because uh women from all over uh, participated in that but uh, you probably dipped in and dipped out or somebody's going to tell you about it but uh tell us about what the women's movement is all about what you guys are doing well the women's movement is constantly evolving there's nothing new about it mm. um this has been as old as i don't know dirt history. Um, the women's movement pretty much is an outgrowth of the bigger banner civil rights movement. And yeah. what has happened is um, there's a duality and a struggle. Uh, even the racism is within the women's movement as well. And the thing that we all have to understand, and hopefully all of this um, unrest that we're going through at, at the moment, uh, with the uh, death of uh, George Floyd is hopefully uh, this country, which was built on um, compromise and complicity, hopefully a lot of that is coming to the light. And hopefully the discussions that need to be had are, ha are being had. And yeah. with the movement uh, chiming in, we see a lot of talk, um, for example, right now, uh, I saw on another show this morning that they were doing a whole exploration of how uh, mothers are talking to their children, yeah, uh, mothers of color. And it's really interesting to see the duality of Caucasian families and, and African-American families or Hispanic families or whoever in this diaspora talking about things that don't seem to affect them or things they're frankly not aware of. So, yeah, we need to do something. I mean, it's going to have to be a, a stop. And people are going to have to come to the realization that, of course, we need peace, justice, policy, and, and, then, and then legislation. See, this was my point about the women's movement being old and, and, and ongoing. Um, we've had these issues from day one. Black yeah. women have white women, have struggled with men, have struggled with being heard and being seen. So yeah. all of these things are sort of uh, linked together. When we look at the history of the evolution of this, um, the abolitionist movement in the United States was a movement of freeing the slaves. The people who get credit for the women's movement, they learn from two places. They learn from the abolitionist movement, but they also learned about um, using their voice and having power from the Native American women, which is a matrilinear society. Um, in New York State, our Native Americans are known as the Haudenosaunee, which is uh, the Haudenosaunee. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good one to practice. They are the Iroquois Federation, the French Huguenots. When they came to America, decided to rename the Haudenosaunee Iroquois. But the point is, though, that people have to understand, uh, all of a sudden, I guess, America is waking up to this idea like, oh, my God, uh, there are Black people with Black children out there. And, oh, what kinds of conversations do they have with their children? Because this is like an epiphany for them. And, and it's so amazing because as a Black man, Dr. Bob, you know from growing up what your life experience has been. 
very similarly, other people of color, black men, black women, have similar experiences. We've experienced discrimination. We've experienced many different vicissitudes, both positive and negative. So this is not an anomaly for anybody of color because yeah. we have good days and bad days like anybody else. Uh, do you believe that the centennial celebration of the 19th Amendment uh, is important for African-American women to participate in? Absolutely. Like I said, African-American women didn't just plop down all of a sudden in 1920 mm. when women got the right to vote. This struggle has been ongoing, Dr. Bob. We will yeah. see in history. How did you come up with the name? Um, you named the conference uh, Seneca Falls We Visited. Tell us right. about that. Well, I, that, and it's funny because it's a good segue in because I very much believe that there were African-American women there and they're very famous and very well-respected historians who have done the due diligence. But all of these people, or for the most part, the people that I know are Caucasian. So they don't understand that, you know, black people were counted in different ways, particularly mm -hmm. if you had any kind of white ancestry. You know, there were Cataroons, Octoroons, all of these different things which had a designation of how Black you were. Oh, yeah. So Crew got to be, yeah, as Seneca Falls Revisited was named, revisited because I want to bring it back. I want to dial it back to 1848 okay. to say, in fact, Black women didn't just, weren't just hatched. We didn't just come out of space. We were very much there. We were always part of this dialogue. The difference mm -hmm. is we were not allowed to be counted and present. So therefore, with that missing factor, there is no way of documenting, oh, um, X, Y, Z, or this one and that one, whatever their names were, were in fact African-American because yeah. they had the for the projection or they had the access. How's your outreach and, and how are we teaching others and what would you like them to learn about your organization and what you're doing? Well, well, we just, well, you know, one of the things, and I'll put everybody on notice because I have to say, due to COVID-19 and now with this race relations situation going on, I'm very disappointed in our current leadership. Of course, there are exceptions and some people are doing terrific jobs, but the yeah. majority of our leadership, they're acting like constituents. And I think that there needs to be a real serious education process because they have to understand they are the ones with the power. So you're not only talking about on a local level, you're talking about on a national level also as well. Absolutely. I cannot even tell you, Dr. Bob, when this thing happened with George Floyd, how many calls I got sitting right here in New York City. I got yep. calls from Texas. I got calls from Minnesota. I got calls from um, uh, Virginia. Other <laughs> places because I got started as the president of National Women's Political Caucus for New uh -huh. York. So my members have moved different places and all that. And some of these people I have not been in touch with since 2017, but they call because they want to know what can we do? How can we get involved here? What 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 should our strategy be? And this is what crew does. Crew teaches you to stop, think, assess. And this is the difference between um, a politician who's kind of going along and getting along and saying what they think their constituents want to hear uh, versus somebody who has a real plan. Where so, can we go for more information on what you're doing? Well, I have a couple of places. Uh, we can go for the basic overall about crew. There's uh -huh. www.crewcremen.org. If you would like to sign up for the conference, that's mm -hmm. www.crewcremen.tv. I want to mention, Dr. Bob, that Crew Women uh, has a OTT nonprofit network. So mm -hmm. we have the ability to broaden. Is that on a website? That's on a website that's also? What Crew, that's what Crew TV is. When you go to the Crew TV site, you will see. Sharon, thank you so much. Sharon Nelson, CEO, Civically Reengaged Women. The crew is in the house. Thank you so much. We thank really you, appreciate Dr. you. Bob. And I really appreciate you for having me on and, you know, keep fighting that good fight. Thank you. All right, we'll take a break. I've got more coming up next on Open.
welcome back. Welcome back. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee, and we've still got a whole lot of opening store for you. I have a guest. He has a small business. He's a small business owner in the Bronx, and he joins us to share what he is doing during this time. We welcome Trey Alexander to the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How are now, you today? Good, good. Now, I understand that you, uh, you're operating. Is it a pop-up or you have a small uh, store open somewhere? Tell us about we it. Have, we have a storefront that is open in the Bronx on 3848 White Plains Road. Yes. Uh, and we're open. We shorten our hours. Um, so we're open from 1 to 7 p.m. Um, but uh, business as usual, we have curbside pickup. Uh, and then we also have our online deliveries. Yeah. So people give you a call and say, hey, I'm coming by. What are some mm -hmm. of the products that you're talking about? So we have all natural handmade soaps, lotions, body butters, bath bombs, lip balms, scrubs, colognes, candles, crystals, deodorant, all everything. Right. Seems like there's a beat <laughs> going on with this. Yes, <laughs> yes. The um, the store, uh, it's, you know, all the products are made right there in the store. So although we're, our hours are shorter, we're still in the store and we're still making things and we're making things um, the same way we've always been. Um, small batches, everything is well controlled. Um, and we, we're still here to build a community in the, in the best ways that we can. And you make everything right there in the store? We make everything right there in the store. And you get the, what's the most popular thing? The body butters? So, yes, the body butters are apple mango body butter. That's one of the most popular ones. Uh, and then our Naga Warrior Soap. Um, Naga the, Warrior Na Soap. All right. Naga Warrior Soap. So that one's peppermint, eucalyptus, activated charcoal, goat's milk, and shea butter. And um, that one will stop any breakouts, uh, pimples, blackheads, whiteheads, uh, ingrown hairs, boils, all of that good stuff. So that one's one of our most popular. That's good. How long have you been in business? Um, so three years now. We've had the storefront for a little over two years, so we're super excited about that. Um, and our numbers continue to grow, um, and we're super excited to be able to spread the good love and energy in the community. All right. So people should call you. How should they contact you? Go online or... Yes, you can call us uh, at the stores 347-346-8707, uh, or you can go online at www.zamboaroma.com and also check us out on social media. You can also Google Zambo Aroma and they yeah. give you a really nice description as well. Hey, thank you so much for joining us, okay? And good luck with thank everything. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, thank once you. again, people can go to your website, say it again. Zamboaroma.com, Z A M B O. A R O M A, Zambo Aroma. Right. There you go. He's Thank you. Now, you started this. You have a partner. You started it with somebody? Else? Yes. Um, yes, my partner, Carlton. Um, you can call Tree or Carlton. We're always there. Um, and we uh, started the company as a family business um, because my little one, his name is Angel. Um, mm -hmm. When he was born, he had really bad eczema and psoriasis. Uh, and um, using the um, products that was prescribed for us wasn't really working. Um, so we switched to uh, a natural recipe that I created. What? Everyone, everyone loved it. Um, Good everyone who baby, knew right? us. Yeah, everyone who knew us, who, who babysat, um, you know, who, who saw the struggle um, with his skin, um, they were all like, what are you using? I need some, I need some. And then that grew into a business. All right, Trey Alexander and his partner, Carlton. Roll. Roll. All right. With yes. Zambo Aroma. Thank you guys so much for joining us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will right, we'll take a break you. right here and we'll come back with more. Keep it right here on BronxNet. Taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC.
Retired NBA player Steven Jackson was not prepared to see his longtime friend George Floyd being murdered at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer when someone shared the viral video with him. Jackson spoke passionately about his friend at a peaceful rally last week in his honor. I'm, I'm here because they're not going to demean the character of Greg or George Floyd, that's right, that's right. my twin. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when police do things that they know that's wrong, the first thing they try to do is cover it up and bring up your background to make it seem like the that they did that they did was worthy. When was murder ever worthy? But if it's a black man, it's approved. You can't tell me when that man had his knee on my brother's neck, taking his life away with his hand in his pocket that that smirk on his face didn't say I'm protected. Oh, that's right. Right. That's right. The entire nation is reeling after the death of Floyd, an African-American man killed by a white police officer, Derek Chauvin, caught on video, kneeling on his neck for over seven minutes. Floyd's death has sparked protests against police brutality. Those protests have featured a number of prominent athletes. Boston Celtics forward Jalen Brown drove 15 hours from Boston to Atlanta to participate in protests there. It's a peaceful protest, but I definitely want to be a celebrity, being an NBA player, don't exclude me from no conversation at all. First and foremost, I'm a black man, and I'm a member of this community, and I grew up on this soil, so I want to say that first and foremost, but it's a peaceful protest. We walking, and that's it raising awareness of some of the injustice that we've been seeing is not okay and as a young person you gotta you gotta listen to our perspective our voices need to be heard I'm 23 years old i don't know all the answers but i feel how everybody else is feeling for sure no question fellow nba standout trey young spoke at a peaceful protest and many others have walked with people asking for change. This, this country is in a messed up place right now. And um, for me, um, I just think it's important that, that we all stick together and we stand up for what's right. And it's not just gonna take just me, it's not just gonna take just you, it's all of us coming together and doing this as a collective unit. And I feel like justice will be served and changes will be made if we all come together and this is, this is us doing it. Some of the biggest names in sports, including stars Michael Jordan, Derek Jeter, Tom Brady, and Tiger Woods, using their voices. The NBA great Jordan says on his social media that he is deeply saddened, truly pained, and plain angry. MJ says he sees and feels everyone's pain, outrage, and frustration adding, I stand with those who are calling out the ingrained racism and violence toward people of color in our country. Met star Pete Alonzo plans to use his platform too. Joining an ever-growing chorus of stars, the 25-year-old first baseman and reigning National League Rookie of the Year posted a statement to Instagram. He calls for justice and vows to fight for those who face racial discrimination. Lewis Hamilton, the first and only black driver in Formula One, took to social media as well to express his anger that nobody from F1 is using their voice to speak out and spread awareness. Hamilton wrote on Instagram, I see those of you who are staying silent, some of you the biggest of stars, yet you stay silent in the midst of injustice. F1 would post a statement, many drivers would stand tall. And as is the case around the sports world and America. Blackout Tuesday became a rallying cry for the movement. The violent protests put the coronavirus pandemic on the back burner and essentially soured some positive news in that regard as well as the potential return of some sports and the actual return of others because of it. The NBA is working on a July return featuring 22 teams in Orlando with an NBA final in October. The NHL has a plan to restart with a 2014 playoff in two hub cities. That format welcomes the upstart New York Rangers, 
something that had to bring some smiles to the faces of New Yorkers during quarantine. And then there was the actual return of racing itself. NASCAR has been in the fold for a couple of weeks, and now IndyCar is back, returning this past weekend in Texas. I spoke with former Indy 500 and series winner Tony Kanaan about what he missed most about the sport. What I miss the most, it's really that feeling that, you know, you, you, it's race week. Like, I woke up today, I was like, man, we're racing Saturday, so I've got to watch my workout. I can't go as hard because it's what I've been doing for the past, I don't know, eight months. So I miss that. I miss that anticipation. I miss that tomorrow we're going to have a team meeting. We're going to talk about the race. We're going to watch the last year's race and evaluate that, that, that I've lived for so long. That's what I'm missing. Five-time series champion and fellow Indy 500 winner Scott Dixon spoke about the growth of the series and its comparison to Formula One. But even with IndyCar back, it's been hard for everyone to overlook how difficult 2020 has been so far. You know, has the pandemic re-energized your hunger for the sport? And has the state of the world, both the pandemic and the protests, led you to believe that we need racing and sports now more than ever? It's just been such a such an unusual, bizarre, sad year for so many people in so many ways. Not being able to go racing, to answer the first part of your question, definitely has, you know, never like, never need to have that spark relit. Uh, but certainly, kid in the candy shop kind of thing. I'm just excited to get back to the track, mate. If if motorsport or sport is the thing that can help unite people, just to make current situation even just one percent better, I would I would go to Texas tomorrow. You know, I would get on a flight now and I would go. Everybody is stressed. Everybody struggled. Uh, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you know, with this situation, it's just hurting our entire life. And to be able to, to, to see something excited, the sport is just the name of it. You know, I think it's, it's a good that one of, one of that is us. And in IndyCar is a, one of the first um, international sport to open the world that uh, they're making people get back on energy and an excitement. I'm excited to get down there. I'm nervous. I think everybody's nervous. If you're not nervous, um, you know, I'd be concerned about the head that you have on your shoulder. <laughs> you're going to probably one of the most intense tracks of the year and you're going there without testing. You're going there without much practice. You're going there without uh, knowing what these tires may bring for us this weekend. You're going there without knowing, you know, what exactly is the aero screen going to do to us uh, on a, on a track like that? I, I don't think it's going to do much uh, visually. It will be a little bit different, but the weight and all of these sorts of things. So a lot of questions to be answered, but uh, at the end of the day, it's the same for, every single one of us. And I, I know that Takuma and I and our team are, are well prepared. Our guys have worked extremely hard. The engineering corps has never stopped working throughout this process. And, uh, you know, I just, I hope that uh, we can come out and be, be very strong. I think no doubt whoever's the best prepared is who's gonna have the most success this weekend. And of course, the grandson of the great Mario Andretti, a new friend to BronxNet, said it best. The world needs sports. He and Andretti teammate Alexander Rossi echoed similar sentiments in speaking on the return of IndyCar. I'm anxious, but I think I'm most excited. I think it's been, uh, you know, it was a long off season to begin with, with part availability with the windscreens and stuff like that. So there was limited testing to begin with. And then obviously when, when COVID hit it, uh, you know, we were, everybody was just kind of on hold. So Really, really excited to get going. I think the world needs more sports, not just us. So it's a, it's a good thing to get going. Uh, it's, it's really, really cool, really exciting. As Marco said, I think the world needs, needs sports, needs entertainment, needs, needs positivity. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get there and, um, you know, not only put on a show for people, but also get our season started and um, pick up where we left off at the end of uh, last year. Yes, the world needs healing more than ever. At your look at sports, I'm Bobby C. Stay tuned for more Open after this.
welcome back. Our next guest is the founding and executive director of Start Small, but Think Big. And she joins us to share more about the, her small businesses that she's working with and the, what they need right now. We welcome Jennifer De Silva. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. What do small businesses need right now? I mean, we all know, but let everybody know. Um, well, you know, I think uh, the this crisis is um, overwhelming everybody on on so many different levels. Um, uh, but I think that people, um, businesses need need many things. Um, they need um, cash. Uh, so uh, in in April, uh, Start Small launched an emergency relief fund. Um, over 80% of our clients indicated that they are in critical need of emergency cash. Um, so um, the fund that we um, opened up um, has close to $100,000 committed to it. Um, oh. and we uh, anticipate being able to dedicate at least another $150,000 in the coming months. Yeah. Um, so I think cash is is certainly cash um, is king as always but the, yes. do you deal with businesses and nonprofit organizations which are businesses also um are the the folks who who we work with are are only for-profit businesses yeah. um so so um the folks who are eligible for start small services and and then who are eligible for our emergency fund are are only for profit businesses. And you've been doing this for some time, right? You for started time. small, but you yeah. thought big. How did you come yeah. up with the name? Um well, I think that's that sort of encapsulates um the my my journey as an entrepreneur, um but I think the journey that that entrepreneurs go through, you you have a a seed of a thought um, and, um, but you, you have to, can, you have to hold on to, um, where you're going, um, what that, what that dream is that you have and, and hold on to that piece of hope, um, yeah. and, and just keep that with you, um, as you are, um, working through those trials and tribulations that, that come at you from all different directions. Um, yeah. You know, we're, that, we're living through that right now. Yeah, sure. Exactly. So. How do people get in touch with you uh, for these emergency funds? Talk about the emergency funds and who's eligible to receive them. Yeah, um, so so folks can um, apply um, online for Start Small Services. Um, they can go to our website, um, which is www.startsmallthinkbig.org. Um, in order to be eligible for the emergency relief fund, you do need to be an active client of Start Small. Um, but um, to apply for our services, you know, it's it's very easy. You just fill out our online application for yeah. assistance. Um, which is available on our website, um, and and once you are an active client, you you are part of um, part of that start small family, um, and then eligible for those for those funds. Um, we we are making uh, grants on a rolling basis. Um, grants range from five hundred dollars up to five thousand um, dollars, and we are um, prioritizing. Um, businesses who have been um, excluded from other um, city, state, or federal relief funds that are currently That's being a great created. idea, yeah. Um, and, and also businesses that, that have been affected by, by the recent upheaval. Um, so so those, are, those are two categories that, that we're really um, looking at in particular. Yeah. So go into the website, fill out the application, and become a part of uh, Start Small, Think Big. Yes. Yeah. All right. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Yep. And your services, uh, other than that, do you have any other services that, that we should know about? Yes. We, we provide free. Uh, all of our services are free. Um, uh, and we offer legal, financial, and marketing support. Oh, great. Yeah. So, um, helping, helping people build um, a sound legal, financial, and marketing infrastructure for their business. So yeah. right now, um, that's um, really focused on helping people access uh, the funding that is available, helping people yeah. think about how to pivot their business um, as they're looking at new sales channels, um, making sure that they can do business online. 
online. Um, but, but um, you know, as you are thinking about what kind of legal issues you have, as you're thinking about um, your, your um, financial infrastructure, um, you know, accounting, bookkeeping, putting together financial statements, um, and then um, what your marketing plan is as you are entering this new space, um, yeah. Circle can help you. I, I, I love your, your romper room background. I mean, it goes along the theme. <laughs> <laughs> Start small, think big. <laughs> I get it. I get it. It's perfect. <laughs> There's a little yes. horse, you know, a little horse that you ride with the stick. <laughs> yes. Um, working working from home um, yeah. with two, two kids. I have <laughs> taken over their bedroom. Um, so they they are romper rooming downstairs. Um, but, but yes. But, but I like it. Trying to small. trying to fit in trying to fit in what you can where you can um, yeah. is the, is the story of every small business owner for it sure. It fits. It fits the background, the whole thing. This this is a marketing tool right here. Start small. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will tell my daughter. <laughs> Start small, think big. We take it. We'll go from here. <laughs> All right, so you have a website and everything, and uh, how are you marketing your business? Yes. Um, so our website is www.startsmallthinkbig.org. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we will welcome um, all small business owners to, to please reach out. Um, we are we are here and we are here and open for business for folks who, who need that support right now. Thank you so much. Jennifer De Silva, founder, executive director, Start Small, Think Big. Thank you so much. And thank you for thank, all you do. Thank you very much. Stay safe. God bless. Thank you. All right. We'll be back with more open next. does it for us unfortunately that's all we have for today and i want to thank all of our guests and you our viewers for tuning in and checking it all out i know there's a lot going on and uh we want to let you know that Bronxnet is here with you every step of the way we want to create the awareness of what's going on in and around our community and beyond so keep it right here and we'll try our best to take good care of you Always remember this, what you are is God's gift to you and what you make of yourself is your gift to God. So choose your choice and let your choice control the truth. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee, 107.5 WBLS. I'll see you then. Peace.